Hello everyone, my name is Gitika Gorky and today I am very, very honored and excited to be interviewing a very, very special space champion, Miss Deborah Factor. Deborah is the head of US Space Systems for Airbus US Space and Defense. She leads the Airbus US Space line of business with a focus on small satellites produced for commercial and government customers and on space exploration activities in the US. Deborah sits on the board of directors for Starlab Space, a joint venture between Voyager and Airbus to build and operate a next generation commercial space station. Deborah is actively engaged as an advisor and mentor in the aerospace community and is a fellow of the AIAA. She sits on the University of Michigan's Aerospace Engineering Industrial Advisory Board and is chair of SSPI WISE former chair of the Board of Women in Aerospace and former treasurer of the Future Space Leaders Foundation. I remember reading about Ms. Factor's journey on LinkedIn and I was incredibly inspired by the work that she has accomplished and seeing her as a woman in the aerospace industry has inspired me so greatly. And so I'm so excited to learn about her journey in the aerospace industry and a little bit more about the work that she's currently doing. So welcome Ms. Factor. Thank you so much for taking your time to inspire the next generation of aerospace leaders. Hi, Gitika. Thank you for having me today. And thank you to all the followers of your work. I know it started a couple of years ago, as I just heard we were in eighth grade and thinking ahead to uh, igniting new ideas. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here on your Ignited Thinkers podcast. So thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, to kick off our conversation, I wanted to first start off asking a little bit more about your day-to-day -day work right now with Airbus. What does your role really entail and what are some of your main goals um, and visions? So, you know, uh, being an executive sometimes uh, or a rocket scientist can seem like it sounds so glamorous. You know, honestly, sometimes my my days, they typically start out with looking at my emails or texts or things that uh, that came up overnight. Although first, I always start with my uh, with my tea. I love hot tea. I'm not a coffee drinker. So I always start with that and, uh, and kind of get set for, for the day. Um, you know, we, uh, uh, a big focus of what I'm doing, as you said, in the intro is on small satellites and also space exploration. So some key things that we're working on right now, Airbus US is developing the Aero 450 commercial satellite. You can see it on, on my Zoom background here, which is evolved from a satellite that we did for OneWeb for their low Earth orbit telecommunications constellation. And we are partnered with Northrop Grumman and delivering satellites for the Space Development Agency for their new proliferated warfighter uh, space architecture. So on a day-to-day -day basis, there's a lot from everything from looking at our strategy for new business and our path for growth going forward. And then there's very much focus on a practical day-to-day -day of execution. So what does that mean? The satellite, so particular for the contracts that we have right now, is uh, working across our team. Um, we've got engineers and program managers, people who are experts in working with different suppliers, contracts, um, uh, quality, safety, facilities, et cetera. So my team in the in the space business is really leading all of the interface to our customers and then working with all of the organizations and people who can actually who actually build uh, build the satellites. So we're very much in, in the middle of that right now and it's it's my number one priority. Another part of the day uh, can be shifting a little bit with the work that we're doing with Starlab. You mentioned standing up the joint venture with Voyager Space, and we're just kicking that off right now. And there's a lot of exciting kind of pre-work activities that go on with our partners at Voyager and also in Europe as we have our Airbus Defense and Space Group 
particularly in, in Germany in this case, uh, where they are working on the Star Lab space station design and uh, leading up to the next design review at the end of the year. Incredible. And I think one of the things I think that's so cool about your job is working with different satellites and, you know, continuously improving the current designs and being able to use satellites for different use, different purposes. And I think satellites have been in the space industry for so long, and it's been an industry that's been rapidly growing. There are new companies constantly emerging. I went to the satellite show um, a few years back, and I just, it was crazy to see how many companies already existed in the space and how many more are emerging. So since you've been in this space for a while, I'm curious, how do you see the satellite space changing in the next 10 years? Because it's been here for so long. And where do you think new satellite companies could come in to play a role um, and not just add, be an extra company that's doing work that everyone else is already doing, but could actually have an advantage and do something different and bring something to the table in this satellite space that's been around for so long? Yeah, it's a great question and a really good observation. Satellites have been around for a while. What we're seeing now is a much bigger shift toward um, commercialization. So traditionally, the way the space industry started was really driven by by governments and by government investment in research and development, and then a growth of an industry to support um, uh those government needs and it really shows that when you have high kind of high risk long term growth um applications that typically you have a lot of r&d funding that that comes from the government and this is true in the us it's true in uh you know across across the the globe the shift then is what happens when you have technologies maybe that developed by the government and now can be put into commercial industry. And we're seeing increasingly commercial investments where the commercial business are saying, hey, we have an infrastructure, we have a set of technologies, of capabilities, of facilities, of, of people and their, their skill sets that we don't have to wait for the government. The government can do super long-term uh, investments where the return is a lot longer or the risk is higher. And instead now commercial companies are saying, hey, we see markets that are more accessible to us today. So let's go invest in those from the start. I'll use an example of the telecommunication satellite market and thinking about constellations. So back in the late 90s, early early 2000s, um, there were a set of commercial companies who were developing LEO constellations. Um, companies like Iridium and Global Star, Teledesic, um, and and others. And in fact, this is what in my career uh, uh, was was motivating investments in new launch vehicles. And because the the business case at the time to launch a lot of satellite or to put a lot of satellites in orbit, not only do you have to worry about satellites, you have to worry about how they get there and what the cost is. And launch was such a huge part of the cost equation that a whole market was triggered for investment in new reusable launch vehicles. I'll come back to that in a, in a second. But on the on the telecommunication side, ultimately, uh, Iridium and Global Star launched. They struggled at the time. Uh, because we're trying to figure out how to take a space asset that was developed pretty much the space industry knows how to work with the government, you know, how to work with the military. They do not know how to work with consumers like you and I. So the motivation was to uh, put in like an internet in space where you could connect your phone from anywhere. Well, eventually, uh, or in a parallel, the, the, cellular industry figured out now oh, maybe we can be a little faster and that technology developed faster so you could have a small you know a smaller phone and fit it uh the original cell phones were huge 
So now maybe you don't need a satellite phone if your cell phone is better. So you had a little mismatch and the market struggled for a while. Iridium and Global Star restructured. And then now you have uh, today, here we are back again with OneWeb, with Starlink, and now some additional constellations who uh, Ravada and Telesat and others, and even in Europe a concept called iris squared saying let's go let's go put more leo constellations into orbit and the reason why we can do that today is cost of launch has come down we have a uh, maturation and miniaturization of technologies and more can be done in low earth orbit and you now have a trend where the U.S. government, particularly Space Development Agency, has recognized that commercial capability can be now translated into a national security application as opposed to the other way around and say, hey, let's go use that and change the whole government architecture. So it's a super exciting time. And there's lots of different factors in there that and variables that that I uh, that I brought up. But the point is, what we're doing today is not new. Uh, and it's also new. Uh, it's new in how we apply it, where the technologies are, um, how we protect things like cybersecurity, and protecting data, uh, trusting the data, trusting the source of our supply chain. So we've really matured in many ways from the um, from 25 years ago with the original test cases, if you will, and uh, and now how you can combine Leo with other orbits in medium uh, Earth orbit and also in uh, geostationary orbit. That's, that's really incredible insight. I actually am not super familiar with the history of the satellite space. And so it's really interesting to hear from, you know, your experienced views, like how the industry has changed over time. It's not just about building the actual advanced capabilities of what a satellite can do, but it's different purposes and the way it's, you know, being used not only by the government, by, you know, the c consumers, different customers here on earth, but how we're transitioning back to different use cases of satellites and how we can advance the satellites to cater for those specific needs. So thank you for that. It's, it's very interesting to see how the dynamic is changing. And I'm sure within even just five to 10 years, like, It'll we'll, we'll have new cases we haven't even thought about today. So it, it's amazing. And as you were speaking, I obviously couldn't help but notice how well knowledgeable you are on this space and how very passionate you are about this topic. And so I'm curious to learn a little bit more about your journey into the space industry. I'm sure it was not a linear path as no one's is, but what was your aha moment that inspired you to pursue a career in the space industry and eventually end up in the specifically the satellite space? So some of your listeners or viewers may have heard uh, heard my story before, but it's uh, I liked math and science growing up, and I thought at first I would be a doctor. My father's a physician, and so that's what I was going to do. Except then I realized I don't like blood. So okay, I had to come up with something else. So I thought, oh, okay, I'll be a I'll be a dentist. And they're like, well, mm, you know, then you're dealing with people's breath all day. So mm, maybe that's not for me either. So I thought, okay, I'll be an engineer. I really did not know what an engineer did. Um, it just seemed to be what you do when you like math and science. So when I was a junior in high school, I went to a career fair uh, in downtown Detroit. I grew up in Michigan. And I listened to a gal from the Society of Women Engineers talk about the best day of her life was when the car engine she designed drove down the street. And I thought, okay, that sounds really boring to me. I do not want to work on cars. And in the Detroit area, everything was cars. It was a huge center of the automobile industry and I thought well now now I can't be an engineer so now you know now what do I do but the space shuttle had first flown when I was in high school and I saw a little flyer from a company uh that was at this uh SWE session in the back of the room and it was from a company who was making parts for the space shuttle 
and for the automobile industry. I'm like, oh, space, that's it. I want to do something that has never been done before. And this is it. I will get my undergrad degree in aerospace engineer. So I'll be in, I'll go into aerospace engineering. Then I'll get my MBA and then I'll be head of NASA. Whoop. You know, there's my, there's my career journey. And it literally was, you talk about an aha moment. It was there. It was that day that I still remember. And it was really thinking about, I think what I articulated at the time, but I didn't realize the implication of it, that the kind of in my values, which today I can talk about is pioneering things. I'm super interested in doing and enabling things that we haven't been, uh, that haven't been done before, which could be a new technology, or it could be a, just a new way of doing things or a new way of thinking. And I have used that as my guiding principle throughout my career to influence um, what choices I made or what opportunities I sought or that I chose to do or to not do. And uh, so I did get my undergrad in aero. I also got my master's in aerospace engineering, both from the University of Michigan. So I did not get an MBA, but instead, since I was really interested in business, I actually started in the MBA program at, at Michigan, a joint engineer with uh, joint with engineering. But then I thought, really, I want to be in aerospace. So having the technical credentials was really important. And I could learn the business. And I, in a way, I, it was already in my DNA, the communication, the way of thinking of um, uh, different different applications and all the, the strategy and the components that you need from a business perspective to pull together uh, an overall system. So instead, when I went to work for a startup and then another startup, that was like an on-the-job MBA. You can learn a lot Great. through real life. And having that perspective was very much um, the combination of experiences of having some technical and then having, uh, I also did some policy work, some international work, um, startups. And those all come together to uh, to where I am today at, at Airbus US. And ironically, on the, the Leo telecommunication side, back in the late 90s, I was working for a startup, Kistler Aerospace, that was developing a reusable launch vehicle for lowering the business case cost of all those constellations. And now fast forward, and this is before <laughs> SpaceX was even born, for example, um, fast forward, and now I'm on the satellite side, but it's in generally that same market space, but it's just evolved in so many, in so many ways, as I mentioned. Oh, wow. That's incredible. And I, I think you mentioned some really good points. I mean, the first one, especially, I think a lot of students can relate with you that there's always this just one aha moment. And I'm so glad it was sweet for you. I know there's a SWE on every campus. It's part of a lot of high school girls experiences. I'm a proud member of Columbia SWE. So I, I definitely think that just having that aha moment is so important. And the more we can reach out to different students and just show them like, hey, have you thought about this? Like, you know, this is a realistic thing. It can like spark a light bulb. And for me, it was like a rocketry club. And for someone else, it could be something else. It's like, wait, this is a realistic thing that I could maybe pursue. Um, it's, it's all about planting the seed. So it's I'm really glad that you were able to discover that, you know, quicken your career um, and get into the field. And, you know, another really good thing you mentioned is about the degrees. I think, especially as a student myself, I'm always like, oh, if I want to go into this field, I need to have this degree, I need to do this, I need to get an MBA. And a lot of students have that fear. So it's really nice to hear that you focused on the technical skills that you can get through a college education. And then you had these experiences that, you know, you thought, oh, this was sufficient for me to get into a leadership role. I built all of these important skills and I didn't necessarily need to get an MBA for that. And so just having that awareness, and I think every student should 
realize that. I think sometimes, as you mentioned, real world experiences are much more valuable than a college education sometimes. Uh, so I, I definitely think that was a really good insight. And it's really comforting to hear it from someone like you who's been able to be a great leader in this field. And so in this journey so far, um, did you have any obstacles? And more importantly, so how were you able to overcome them? A lot of times we can look at someone's LinkedIn stories or their accomplishments and be like, oh, they just had it all together from day one. So I'm, I'm a little bit curious about how that journey was like for you yeah so before i do that maybe i'll just go back and do a little plug for SWE and organizations uh, other other uh, professional organizations so SWE was really instrumental in that in that aha moment so i was also president of SWE in, at Michigan in our student chapter. And I think that year we won the best national student chapter or something. And it was super, um, super good to have a community of, in this case, women um, and across engineering, not just aerospace. So getting exposure. Uh, another one of my values is about community and doing things together since especially something like space, we cannot do it alone. We need each other and many, uh, and even globally to accomplish some of the great exploration dreams that, that many people have. So getting involved in, when you're in college, SWE or AIAA or, um, you know, a rocket club or a sorority or fraternity or a service-oriented group, there are so many things you can learn, so many people you can meet and ideas that come together that enhance what you're doing in the classroom. So huge fan of that. And um, even today, I am active in many organizations, as you as you noted, and it's a great way to connect across different um, disciplines and fields and also down when you have something that's really super specific aerospace let's say or medicine or then space medicine as you as you expressed an interest in so huge plug for that um the second plug i want to say you, you brought up about um the graduate education journey. And I do often get asked, it's like, well, do I, should I go to grad school? Do I need a master's? Um, should I get a PhD? Or what about an MBA? Um, you know, my advice is always, <laughs> it doesn't matter. You say, what? What do you mean it doesn't matter? Okay, if you want to be a medical doctor, yes, you have to go to medical school. You want to be a lawyer? Yes. Do you have to go to law school? Um, when you're in uh, in engineering or any other field, you want to go to grad school. You know, I always say, if you are interested in learning and you are still learning and you're still on that journey, there's something specific, do it. You, and you can go straight through. You can do it later. You can do it part-time. You And if you are done with school, don't go because you won't like it. You won't be happy. You won't learn anything and it will be a waste. So really it's a personal choice and to not feel pressured one way or the other because you'll figure out your journey. So that's a little side thing about your uh, knowing that a lot of students listen. Um, on obstacles, you know, yes, there's, there's, always obstacles. It's hard work and in any career and, and life in general. So obstacles can be ones that sometimes you put in your own way, which is the obstacle in your head of, of what do you think you can or, or can't do. You can have an obstacle that somebody or something puts in your way or that you think they've put in your way. And then there are obstacles that really are uh, challenges to be overcome that we don't really know the answer for. So whatever category they're in, I would say, first of all, personally, in my own growing up and in my own DNA, I, uh, I'm very positive. It's a trait of mine. And I always think something can be done. 
It's just a question of how are you going to do it? What do you need to maneuver around? How creative can you be and go go solve it? I my brain thinks in here's the objective and then how you do it and figure it out um, is more a puzzle and a creative side. So it's maybe not an obstacle. It's a just a way of a way of thinking. And I've always believed I can do whatever I set my mind to. And I grew up with a very supportive family who also supported that. And and I don't know, I always assumed I would do I would do something and do do great things. Um, on, and on other things, you know, on a day to day, when something comes up, really, we all choose how we respond. You can react and, and be frantic and be all stressed out. It does happen. It's natural. And so it's a matter of building up the team and the support. And, uh, when you're having a challenging moment or day or year, in having that community around you, your family, your friends, your coworkers, um, your mentors, your your dog, uh, <laughs> could be anything to just sort of settle in and say, what am, I always ask myself, what is my desired outcome? What am I trying to achieve? And kind of go back to that, say, okay, <sighs> deep breath. Here's what I'm trying to get at now, okay. How can I do it? Who do I need to partner with? What do I need to smooth out? And what kind of old-fashioned hard work is needed? Because talking about the problem alone is not going to solve the problem. You have to actually do things. Uh, but figuring out that path and getting enough calmness to not be uh, so stressed out that, that you lose sight of your goal. You know, I think those are, it's, it's a mindset change. And I, I completely agree with you. I think sometimes we can be overly stressing ourselves out. And sometimes you just take a step back and you think about what the problem was and how can I approach this is, is so important. And I heard this, this quote, it's like rejection is a redirection or like an obstacle can yeah. be viewed as like a redirection. It's so important that, you know, like you said, it's like a puzzle piece, figuring out how you can move something, maneuver something to get to that end goal or that, you know, one step to get closer to your goal is, is so important. And thank you for also sharing about the different organizations that students can get involved in. And, you know, also realizing you don't have to go to a graduate program um, unless it's required by your training, of course, um, that there are other options. Um, and, and, you know, uh, one of the things i I think I admire greatly about you is regardless of where you are in your career, a big part of what you've been doing is mentorship. Um, I read that you were named the SSPI mentor of the year. And I think it's like individuals like you who give back to students like me who, um, you know, make the difference of the world. I mean, I would, the people I've met on LinkedIn become my really close mentors. I would definitely not be where I am today or know anything about space medicine if it wasn't for them. So I think just having mentors like you forming a community of supporters, whether it be your family, friends, or individuals you network with, it's so important to build that space where you can focus on how you can overcome any obstacles and get one step closer to your goals. So really, thank you so much, uh, Ms. Factor, for taking, taking your time to do this interview today. I think your journey and the work you're doing is incredibly inspiring for so many students around the world. Um, and I'm definitely one of them. So again, thank you so much for doing this interview. And I hope to even meet you in person one day. Oh, you're welcome, Vitika. It's been my pleasure to do it. It's always fun to know that uh, students come together and uh, you know, I, I'm a lifelong learner, so I still consider myself even a student and opportunity to to grow and share. So I hope my my story can inspire some others and or at least, you know, create some conversations around um, how to handle challenges that come up or thinking about grad school, as you mentioned, and also just knowing the market space is huge startups uh traditional companies there's innovation that goes on everywhere and it's not just the size of the company or the the role you have in an organization but it, coming down to the mindset the willing to collaborate listen learn and um uh, and create 
something that who knows what what's going to be out there next. I look forward to seeing whatever you and your peers invent next what that what that next ignition is it's uh, uh always makes me feel better about the future to have conversations like this so thank you for inviting me thank you so much thank you